hello and welcome. Thanks again for joining us for another pre-arrival webinar. Um, today we'll be discussing applying for your U.S. visa. Um, if this is your first time joining us, my name is Grace Fuller and I serve as the Manager of Student Experience and Engagement at ISPO. And ISPO is one of four units in the Global Education Department, which also includes our International Faculty and Scholar Office, Study Abroad, and the Office of the Dean of Global Education. And these pre-arrival webinars we do in partnership with the Graduate Division. So ISPO, as well as the Graduate Division, would like to congratulate you, first off, on your acceptance to UC San Diego. Um, both our offices are here to assist you throughout your stay in the United States as well as provide services that enhance the quality of your experience, not only in the US, but also as you go through your academic program at UC San Diego. Like I said, my name is Grace Fuller and we have some wonderful colleagues here to join us today. I'll let them introduce themselves, starting with my colleague, Gabby. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I echo Grace in offering my congratulations to all of you for being admitted to UC San Diego. Uh, my name is Gabby Hoffman, and I am the Assistant Director of International Students, Student Experience and Engagement at ISPO. And I'll go ahead and pass it along to Mary. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. My name is Mary Hogan, and I am the Director of Graduate Admissions in the Graduate Division. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to my colleague, Shauna. Hello, everyone. My name is Shauna Slabiota. I also work in the graduate division. And in my role, I help coordinate a new graduate student orientation and welcome events for new grad students. So looking forward to welcoming you to our campus. Great. So a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, so one, you are in listen-only mode, which means you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. Um, so the primary way that you'll actually engage with us today is through the Q&A feature on your Zoom menu bar. Um, so you can submit questions throughout the presentation, but we have dedicated time at the end for a live question and answer session. If for some reason we don't get to your question today, um, you can always contact us via icontact.ucsd.edu. And finally, we are recording. So you will be able to view this webinar recording as well as any previous webinar recordings at iwebinars.ucsd.edu by clicking on webinars for newly admitted students. And that's also where you'll be able to find um, any upcoming webinars we may have and be able to register for those. So again, if you um, haven't used the Zoom um, question and answer feature yet, um, this is what it will look like on your control panel. Um, so you, you should be able to um, answer a question that way. And the chat has been disabled. So the Q&A feature will be the way that you're able to interact with us. Um, our presenter today might be sharing different links that are relevant to you via the chat, um, but you'll be submitting your questions or comments um, via the Q&A feature. And again, you can submit those at any time in the presentation, but we will have a live question and answer session at the end. With that, I'll hand it over to my colleagues from graduate admissions. All right, so um, a quick reminder, or a few quick reminders, I should say, um, from graduate admissions. So now um, that you've been admitted, it is really important to take a look at your applicant status portal. So that's the portal um, that's linked here. Um, and there's a few items in there that you'll need to take a look at. And everyone's portal might look a little different depending on what remaining requirements you have. So as we state here, um, please be sure to fill out that statement of legal residence form. There are a few programs that do not require that form. Um, mainly there's a few, if you're um, a part of the Flex MBA program and a few other programs at Rady. So if you don't see the statement of legal residence form in your portal, it's likely not required of you. Um, but if you ever have any questions around your requirements, you can reach out directly to us on this email address, the grad admissions at ucsd.edu uh, email. You'll also see a checklist. So you'll be able to track the documents that have been received as you could when you were still waiting to hear back from UCSD. But now as an admitted student, 
many of you or most of you have likely been admitted provisionally. And so what that means is we have made our admissions decision based off of all of the documents that you've submitted. And oftentimes those documents are not considered final and official. So they may be documents that you sent in yourself and they come directly from your school, um, or you may currently be in a um, graduate program or undergraduate program and you don't have your official final transcripts yet. And so under your pending admissions document section, you'll see a list of all of the documents that you specifically need in order to finalize your admission. So it's really important to get started on those items as soon as possible because it can take some time to get in touch with former institutions, um, you know, to work through any processes that you need to go through in order to get those official documents. And too often we see students leave these until the very last minute and it can lead to some stress down the line um, because eventually if you are continue to miss these documents once you matriculate to UC San Diego, um, it will lead, missing official documents will lead to administrative holds that can prevent enrollment in moving forward. So if you have any questions around the documents that are required of you, please don't hesitate to email us. Um, we entirely understand that for some of you, you're still in your graduate programs or undergraduate programs and completing and you may not have a final transcript yet. That's okay. It's just really important to know that these documents are required of you and as soon as you can to be requesting them. Um, so we always like to emphasize that. Okay, and so here is another view of your portal. So again, everyone's portal is going to look a little bit different, um, but you'll see here under forms, so you see your decision reply form that you've um, already looked at, and then if the statement of legal residence form is required of you, that is where it will show up. For students who are participating in RADI programs, your portal will look a little bit different, um, but it'll largely look the same and you'll still see that pending admissions documents section with instructions for how to submit your documents um, and there will be a list. So everyone's portal is going to look a little different, but as you can see, we list our email address here. And I do just want to emphasize, um, if you see both like up toward the bottom where it says for e-transcripts, please have them sent to grad admissions. So that's correct, but they cannot be sent from you. So if you're sending e-transcripts or really any official documents, um, there are a few minor exceptions that would be listed on your portal, but largely all official documents, they need to come directly from the issuing institution. And they will not be considered official if they come directly from you. So something I just like to emphasize. Um, and then we also list our address so documents can be sent by mail to our office as we state documents cannot be accepted if they've already been opened um, or if they were resealed by the student. If you only receive one copy from your institution of your official transcript or official certification and they only will issue you one and you don't want to send it in, you do have the option once you arrive on campus to come into our office physically during our walk-in hours and present us with the official document in its sealed envelope, um, at which point you would then open it, make sure it's all official, scan it, and then give you the documents back. Um, however, it is important to remember that they cannot be opened. So it has to come to us in that sealed envelope. Something I really like to emphasize to avoid, help you avoid stress down the line. Okay, so now we're going to uh, jump into the main portion of our presentation today, and that is applying for your US visa. Um, hopefully, some of you were able to join us last week for our uh, presentation on getting started, uh, where we covered some of these initial steps. Um, but if not, that's okay. This is a great review um, to getting started on applying for your US visa. 
So the first part, um, the, the beginning of any international student's journey is getting your visa documents from the International Students and Programs Office. Um, and this includes students who are already here in the US if you're transferring your record to us, which we'll go over in a moment, or if you're overseas and you are applying for your first uh, visa document to come to the United States. So let's go over uh, first how to obtain your F1 or J1 visa for studies at UC San Diego. As an international student, you must have your CVIS Form I-20 to apply for the F1 visa or a CVIS Form DS-2019 to apply for the J1 visa. Uh, whether you are applying for an I-20 or a DS-2019, both can be requested using our online system called the iPortal. We began accepting applications as of March 1st, so you are welcome to apply for your I-20 or DS-2019 now if you have not already done so. The direct link for the iPortal, uh, Grace has put that in the chat, it is iPortal.ucsd.edu. Uh, just a quick note, because there was some confusion um, in our last webinar about the I-20 versus the DS-2019. Um, most students apply for the I-20 to get the, uh, the F-1 visa. Um, however, graduate students, um, typically, because they are funded 50% or more, many of them are at least, um, by their department, have a choice. They can apply for either the I-20 for an F-1 or a DS-2019 for the J-1. Um, there are several differences between the two. We're not going to go into those today, but when you go into your iPortal application, or if you go to our main website and just type in F1 versus J1, you can see a clear chart that outlines the differences and what might be a better option for you. Um, again, most come on the F1, but if you're considering the J1, there's more information on our website and in the iPortal. So most students will receive a visa document with a September start date. However, we are aware that many students begin their programs of study earlier th than this, um, sometimes as early as June or July, uh, August, uh, and that depends on your department. If you require an earlier start date on your visa document, you are able to request this within the iPortal. Uh, just be aware in terms of processing times that our processing time for a visa document is 15 business days from uh, the submission of a complete application. So we recommend you apply early to avoid any delays in booking your visa appointment. And then once you do receive your I-20 or DS 2019, you can book your visa appointment at your local U.S. Embassy, if available, um, to obtain your visa stamp and your passport for entry into the U.S. if you are outside the U.S. If you're unable to secure your visa in time for entry, um, you may need to consider beginning your program um, a little bit later, but we'll get into that later. We hopefully won't even have to even discuss that or, or look into those options, but there are options available um, and we will go over that support available to you if that does happen. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> So again, a little bit more about submitting your request in the iPortal. We want to make sure everyone has a clear understanding of how this works. Um, so once you accept your offer of admission um, in the portal that Mary went over um, and you pay your deposit to UC San Diego, you'll receive an invitation email um, to, and information within the portal to access the iPortal. Um, we do recommend that you wait um, anywhere between um, 40 to 48 hours up to 72 hours sometimes um, before getting access or attempting access into the iPortal. Um, sometimes there are delays in um, your, um, the, the creation of your UCSD account to gain access. So we just recommend you wait a couple of days. If you're having access issues, just give it a little bit of time. Um, but you will use your single sign-on information to gain access to the iPortal. So once you're able to log in though, um, you'll be asked for um, various different pieces of information, the main ones being a copy of your passport, <clears throat> as well as uh, financial documents um, showing um, funding support for your program. Um, so for many of our graduate students, that comes in the form of a department support letter, um, whatever financial support package you have, that can be through a fellowship or a TA ship or GSR, any of those are accepted. Um, as long as they are, you know, spelled out in your department support letter. Um, we also have grad students who maybe their department isn't funding their full program, 
um, or they just have a different setup with their with their financial support, um, they can also upload personal funds, evidence of personal funds. Um, it can be a combination of the two. That's totally fine. Um, and um, we do ask that those financial support documents are no older than six months from the date that you submit your application. Um, so be aware of those expiration dates no older than six months from the, days, the day that you submit. To find out more about minimum funding requirements to obtain your I, uh, I-20 or DS 2019, um, Grace has popped that in the chat there. Um, the main website to remember is inewstudent.ucsd.edu, but you can go directly to that chart there and take a look um, so you make sure you're uploading sufficient evidence so we can go ahead and process your application. <clears throat> All right. So again, to go over the differences between the two different forms here, if you will be applying for an F-1 visa and require them form I-20, um, we will be issuing these to you electronically. Um, this was changed during the pandemic, thankfully. It's, it's a great improvement that the Student and Exchange Visitor Program instituted. Um, so we can upload these for you directly in the iPortal, and you can download this um, sign it and take it with you for your visa appointment and also for travel. It is completely valid for use. Um, so again, within that 15 day processing time, once you've submitted your application, you will be able to see this in your iPortal application to download. Um, for the Form DS-2019, those of you who are applying for the J-1 visa, unfortunately, uh, the J-1 program is um, is handled, it's under the Department of State, a different agency, and they have different rules. Um, they still do require that students obtain a hard copy for the DS-2019 um, in order to obtain a visa and for travel. Um, so in that case, you will be um, given information on how to set up um, a mailing account, express mail, or via USPS if you are in the US, or you can come to ISPO and pick up the document in person if you are here locally. Um, but those are all options available to you to get your hard copy. Right. <clears throat> so once you have those documents in hand, now it's time to go over booking your visa appointment and how to go through that process. So next slide. Um, note that, uh, just a quick note before we get into the visa process, citizens of Canada and Bermuda do not need to apply for the F-1 or J-1 visa if they are overseas and entering the U.S. with their document. However, they still must present their valid I-20 or DS-2019 upon requesting entry into the U.S. You still do need those documents if you are a citizen of one of these countries. Um, those um, from Canada and Bermuda also have to pay certain visa-related fees, like the CVIS fee, which we'll go over later in the presentation. Um, but do know that you don't need to obtain a visa stamp in your passport, like the majority of our other students do need to. <clears throat> All right, next slide. So for those of you who do need to apply for the F-1 or J-1 visa outside the U.S., once you have your document in hand, whether that's downloaded from your iPortal application, um, in the case of the I-20, or your DS-2019, then you can go ahead and book your visa appointment. Um, so you do need to have your I-20 or DS-2019 in hand in order to book this. Um, and that's because when you do go online to book your appointment at your local U.S. Embassy, you need what is called your CVIS ID. And that is circled here, um, you should see. Um, on screen um, for the I-20, uh, you'll see here on screen, it's in the upper um, left-hand corner. Thank you, Grace. And then for the DS-2019 for our J-1 students, it's in the upper um, right-hand corner. So that, that number is needed to book your visa appointment. Sometimes um, we do realize, obviously, visa appointments book up quickly. Summer is a very busy season, spring as well. So if that's the case, if we have processed your documents and you are just waiting for it to be mailed to you, in the case of a, um, the DS-2019 especially, sometimes we can go ahead and just send you your CVIS number ahead of time if you email us. Um, if it's ex you know, extremely urgent and, and you've been able to book an appointment and there's you know, limited availability, please, please contact us and we can do that for you. Um, but for the majority of students, um, they obtain their document and then use that number to book the appointment once they have it in hand. 
Um, J1 students, just a quick note as well, you will also need what is called the J1 program number in addition to your CVIS ID that's circled there um, to book your visa appointment. So this is UC San Diego's J1 exchange visitor program number. <clears throat> Um, so again, that's the quick quick difference in looking at the two documents and then the information you'll need in order to go ahead and book your appointment. Next slide. So I want to take a moment here to talk about visas and, and a, a quick break because we're talking here about you know students who need to obtain their documents who are overseas and need a visa stamp right in your passport that you're getting from the embassy to enter the U.S. But there are different situations, especially for graduate students who might have already been here, pursuing their undergraduate degree, perhaps you already have a US visa, um, perhaps you are studying in F1 status and you're transferring your record over to us, do you need to get a new visa stamp? So I've gone over a few scenarios here just to kind of highlight that for you, what it kind of means to use a previous F1 or J1 visa stamp if it's valid, if you have one already. So we'll go from green to red here, <laughs> um, kind of what you can do, what you can't do. So in the example of, I have a CVIS transfer I-20 or DS-2019, that is my school, um, I am here in the US, my school transferred my F1 or J1 record to UC San Diego. My visa from that school in my passport is still valid. Um, can you use this visa stamp? Um, if you are outside the US, let's say you're traveling between programs between the end of that program and coming into the US. Yes, you can still use that visa stamp, even if your school name doesn't match your um, I-20 or DS-2019 to your visa stamp in your passport, that's okay. We have many, many, many students who transfer to UC San Diego. They get a UC San Diego I-20. It says our school name on the I-20 or DS-2019, but it has their old school name on their visa stamp in their passport. That's totally okay as long as it is still as it is still valid. You can still enter the US. Only your CVIS ID needs to match. That's the most important thing. So if you're transferring your record to us, um, that CVIS record will remain the same. It will still match, and that is still valid. Um, now, a quick note for those of you who are transferring and staying in the US over the summer. So this is really only for students who are transferring, and maybe you're going home and re-entering the US. If you're staying here over the summer, you're not going, leaving US borders, um, you're just ending your previous program and then coming to UC San Diego, whether or not your visa stamp is valid, even if it is expired, that is okay. You don't need a valid visa stamp to continue your program here. Um, as long as your I-20 or your DS-2019 is valid and you've obtained it from UC San Diego. Now, of course, if you're traveling in the future and you want to re-enter the US, you need to renew that visa stamp. That's really your ticket to enter the United States. But if you're staying here, you don't need to worry about renewing it, even if it's expired. All right, the next scenario. This student, I have a brand new UCSD I-20 or DS-2019. I also have a valid F1 or J1 visa stamp in my passport that I used from attending from my old school. In this um, case, um, you may be able to use this visa, but we recommend verifying with your, your local U.S. consulate first. Some consulates have different rules about this. Um, it's um, uh, if, a, if a student hasn't used a visa from a previous school, maybe they're getting admission somewhere else, sometimes U.S. consulates will not recognize that visa for use, so we recommend you check with your local consulate first. And in the last scenario here, I have a brand new I-20 or DS-2019. I also have a valid J-1 visa stamp in my passport from a past visa appointment with a different school name, but I never used it to enter the US. So this is the case where sometimes students, of course, will apply for different schools for admission um, and they choose you know, maybe one school or an, over another. They think they're going to go there, they get a visa, um, and an I-20, I should say, and a visa that has that school name on it, but then they change their mind and they decide to come to UC San Diego. Can I use that visa, even though I've never used it, to enter the US? Um, in that case, you cannot use this visa to enter the US. Um, you'd have to apply if you've changed your mind, um, you've never used that past visa to enter the US for that previous school, then you would definitely need to get a new visa specifically for UC San Diego to enter the US. 
So these are just some case studies, some scenarios. I know it can be very confusing. Um, we recommend if you have any confusion over whether or not you can use a previous visa stamp um, to contact us at icontact.ucsd.edu. Um, and always, always, if you're unsure, ultimately, if you are overseas, the US consulate where you are planning to process your visa, they um, can provide the best guidance as to whether you need it or not. Um, they have the most current up-to-date guidance. <clears throat> All right, next slide. <clears throat> All right, so now making your visa appointment. Um, some of you have done this before. Again, if you've, you've been in the US um, and you've gotten an F1 or J1 visa, but the first thing you're going to do is to book your visa appointment um, online. Go to usembassy.gov and locate your nearest US embassy. This will give a comprehensive list um, of where embassies are currently operating in your local area. You will go and navigate to the non-immigrant section of the closest embassy's website and follow those specific application instructions located there. Um, though for the most part, the US student visa application process requires the same steps no matter where you apply, there may be certain procedures that vary from embassy to embassy. Um, so be sure to pay attention to this. They will list all those requirements um, on the website of your local embassy or consulate. All right, and one of the first steps all applicants must complete, this is part of actually booking your appointment, is filling out the Form DS-160, or the Non-Immigrant Visa Application Form. Um, again, be sure to have your passport and Form I-20 or DS-219 nearby so that you can input or upload the required information from these documents. Um, you'll be asked to provide the address of the school you're attending, as well as the name of a school contact. This information is located on your Form I-20 or DS-2019. You can put down the name of the International Student Advisor um, who is listed on your document as the school contact. Um, if you're bringing dependents with you, for example, a spouse or children, um, you can add their information to this application as well. And then once your application is complete, you'll print your confirmation page and bring that with you to your appointment. Um, there is a fee required for your visa appointment, um, which is $160 uh, US dollars. That's called the MRV fee. Every person has to, to pay for this. Um, each embassy, though, does handle this visa fee differently. Um, some require payment in person, whereas some required online before your appointment. So again, be sure to review your um, closest embassy's instructions so you're aware of when and how to pay for this. Um, and again, that, note that all F1 or J1 visa applicants do have to pay the visa fee, even if you are renewing an expired visa or, or J1, uh, F1 or J1 visa stamp. Next slide. The second fee you must pay before attending your visa interview is called the CVIS fee or an I-901 fee. Um, this is accessible by going to fmjfee.com. This is required of all students applying for an initial F1 or J1 visa stamp for the very first time. Um, and it's also required for citizens of Canada and Bermuda uh, before entering again the US for the very first time. So those fees for the F1, it's $350 currently, and for J1, it's $220. Uh, pay this fee online with a credit card or a debit card. I believe some uh, allow this by a Western Union wire service or by mail. Uh, you can book your visa appointment prior to paying this fee, but be sure to pay the fee, this fee at least three business days before your visa interview to allow for processing. Um, again, for citizens of Canada and Bermuda, also make sure to pay this at least three business days before you appear at a US port of entry to come into the United States. Uh, so for more information, you can watch the following tutorial um, that's linked here about how to pay the fee. Um, this is directly from the FMJ fee website. Okay. So next, let's go into preparing for your actual visa interview. If you haven't done this before, this will kind of give a brief overview. Okay, so these are the items that you will need to bring with you to your visa interview. Uh, your passport, which is valid up to six months after your intended date of entry into the United States, 
your original or downloaded Form I-20, and then for J-1 students, your original Form DS-2019. Um, the evidence of financial support for your studies at UC San Diego, and this is the same documentation that you, you provided to us um, to get your visa documents. You'll need your receipt of your DS-160 application fee and payment, and the receipt of your CVIS I-901 fee payment. Um, you'll also need documentation of, home, of a home country address to show that you have ties to your home country. Um, and this is always a little bit difficult, right, to prove, but anything like a utility bill um, or anything showing that you have a permanent address in that country of residence where you're living and then have can show that you have ties to that home country in that way is acceptable um, for your visa appointment. So at the interview itself, um, every visa interview will differ slightly from person to person, um, especially so now. Um, the uh, visa appointments, I, we know due to the pandemic in certain embassies and consulates, um, depending on the COVID rates in that country, some have been um, processing visa appointments um, I should say remotely, meaning that you don't have to appear in person for visa appointments. You can send in your documents and they you know, issue the visa and uh, return your documents when it's approved. Um, so this has varied a lot over the last couple of years, but in general, if you are asked to appear in person, um, you should be prepared to just be brief, maintain a positive attitude in your, in your interview, um, just know that consular officers are often under pressure to conduct these interviews quickly and will, for the most part, um, form an impression of you from, you know, the very first minute of your interview. So just keep your, in your answers short, to the point. Um, you don't have to offer information, just answer the questions that are actually asked of you. Um, be prepared to be asked uh, about your program of study and how it fits into your long-term career goals. Um, you should also be prepared to explain clearly your plan to return home after your program of study. So again, remember that the primary purpose of the F-1 visa or J-1 visa is to study in the United States. Um, it's not to be given a chance uh, to work during or after your studies, even though it is a benefit of your visa, it's not the main purpose. So focus on your studies. Um, that's your main goal of applying for the visa. Uh, be prepared, just know that the main interview is conducted in English rather than your native, uh, native language in that country. Um, and again, be sure to demonstrate ties to your home country. Um, this is a difficult thing to prove and there's no magical document uh, showing that, you know, you will be, uh, that they will guarantee these issuance. You just need to show that in your conversation that for, that your reason for returning home um, is stronger than any reason to remain in the U.S. long term after your program. So, for example, it could be a job, a family, owning a house or apartment, investments, uh, financial prospects that you will inherit, that kind of thing. Um, this can be uh, helped, again, by bringing in any documents related to your family's home ownership and things of that nature uh, to show that you plan to return to your home country. All right, next slide. So <clears throat> I wanted to spend some time to go over visa delays, potential visa denial issues, because, you know, it does happen. We don't, we want to be completely honest. Um, it doesn't happen to many of our students, but it does happen. Um, and we, they understandably can cause anxiety um, and delays, again, because they're not completely uncommon, we want to know, let you know what is available. So let's go over um, what you should do if you have a visa delay or denial. Um, the more common issue that we see related to uh, visa denials is called administrative processing. So every year we work with a handful of students. Um, and when I say a handful, we typically issue documents for about 3,000 international students to come into UC San Diego every year. Um, and on average, maybe we see 10 to 15 total students who are uh, experiencing administrative processing. So it is not a lot. Um, that being said, we've seen an increase over the last um, couple of years. Uh, we're hoping this decreases um, post, you know, kind of as we're as we're hopefully winding down from the pandemic. Um, but this is not a lot, but we still want to go over this with you. So um, administrative processing, uh, what it basically is, is and nationals of certain countries um, and all international students whose area of study has been deemed uh, sensitive by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security 
will have their name submitted for a special security clearance procedure that may take up to 60 days before a visa is issued. So this is not a flat out denial, this is just additional processing. Um, this time frame of 60 days does vary by country and consular post. It could be shorter, it could be longer. Um, disciplines such as nuclear technology, chemical, biotechnology, engineering, uh, advanced computer, microelectronic technology, as well as a broad range of engineering and physical sciences are on the uh, what is called the technology alert list. Um, so students in these fields could expect delays in obtaining visas at consulates abroad if they deem it sensitive. Uh, so what do you do, again, if your application is put under administrative processing? Um, you should receive a letter, uh, it's called a 221G letter, from the consular officer indicating your visa application is on hold until security clearances can be completed. Um, you may or may not be asked to follow up and submit additional support documents for your application to be reviewed and processed. Um, if you don't receive a 221G letter at your interview and you believe your application is being put through administrative processing, be sure to follow up with the embassy um, or the consulate to confirm. Um, you can email them or call them directly. Their information is on their main website. Um, while this, proce this processing is pending, you can check the status of your visa application yourself by going to the U.S. Department of State's website um, that is listed here. If it's been more than 60 days since your visa interview or since you submitted any requested documents to support your application, um, you can contact the consular embassy directly for an update. Um, and you can also contact ISPO, which I'll go over momentarily. Um, unfortunately, administrative processing is a waiting game. There is little you can do, um, but you can check on your visa application status while it goes through uh, the required security clearances. Um, and I do want to stress that it's, it is very tough to get updates, um, even working with contacts at our consulates um, in different areas of the world. They themselves sometimes, uh, most of the time, I should say, once a, an application um, is put forward for administrative processing, they themselves do not know how long it will take because it is sent over to the Department of State um, and they handle all of that and they are not uh, allowed to give updates or information. So it's a lot of it is just kind of unknowns, unfortunately, um, but we can provide support, which we'll go over here in the next slide. <clears throat> So if your application has been placed under administrative processing, um, it's important you communicate with uh, mainly with two offices, uh, ISPO, our office, and your department. Um, we can provide support to you during this time by providing additional documentation that might be requested by the embassy or consulate. We can also advocate for you. Um, so for example, departments, um, if requested, can provide more detailed study plans. If this is requested, sometimes the consular official um, wants more information specifically about what you're studying, um, and they can assist um, potentially with this information. Um, they can confirm certain research or study-related information on official letterhead. Um, also, ISPO can follow up directly, again, with the U.S. consular embassy with a support letter on your behalf if your administrative processing uh, case has gone beyond um, 60 days. Um, we do actually have a request process built in. Um, we do definitely recommend contacting ISPO if this, if this is the case, first and foremost, um, because we have a request within the iPortal, a letter request, um, that you can, where you can request a letter of support um, to be sent to you to provide to the embassy if this happens. Um, and we've also um, included information here for your department um, if you are experiencing these, these delays, just so they can be kept in the loop. You know, if, if this ends up um, impacting your arrival, if you have delayed arrival, your department will need to make adjustments and that sort of thing. So we want to make sure that they are in close contact, they know what's happening, so they can plan accordingly and help support you as well. So again, you can contact us at inewstudent at ucsd.edu along with your department if this happens, um, and we can um, help provide some letters of support if needed. <clears throat> right. So now we'll go over some additional resources, um, both visa and non-visa specifically related. Um, you know, obviously these last two years have been um, full of, of, of upheaval and change and having to pivot constantly. Um, so we wanna make sure that all of you are informed and are up to date as you plan your entry into the United States for this summer or fall. So the first um, 
sort of links we want to provide to you here. Uh, the first one here is iupdates.ucsd.edu. So this is housed within the International Students and Programs Office website. Uh, this is a page that provides up-to-date information on campus um, operation, how it relates to you, um, you know, getting your visa, or if there are any visa delays or travel delays, for example, due to the pandemic. This is where we will post this information. Um, we will also send it out in news newsletters. Um, we do communicate with our students, our new students, throughout the spring and summer with travel updates, um, any visa delay updates. Um, but you can also find this on our iupdates.ucsd.edu page. Um, we have information about enrollment, about visa and immigration documents, travel. So it's a whole list of FAQs, frequently asked questions about what to expect as the campus um, is returning to full in-person instruction, um, moving into this next academic year. This will provide um, that support and those those resources as you're wondering what does this look like for me traveling or um, what does this look like for me if I need to be you know obviously vaccinated um, how do I do this as someone from a different country um, who might have different um, vaccination um, access things of that nature um, this is all listed and outlined here and we'll point you in the right direction for those resources And um, again, um, further resources, and I think this is really a very, very important one for all of our students, no matter what, is our Return to Learn website. Um, so this, we encourage you to become familiar with UC San Diego's, this is a campus-wide site, Return to Learn, which outlines um, the campus's return to um, in-person instruction and all of various different um, safety protocols, precautions, um, everything that the campus is doing um, to make sure that the community is safe as we return to in-person instruction. Um, return to Learn site um, also includes a Return to Learn dashboard that's live um, where you can find information um, about, again, campus efforts to return to in-person, um, what um, vaccination requirements are, um, guidelines for coming to campus, masking requirements, indoor versus outdoor, that sort of thing, what all of those different rules are. Everything is listed here everything is up to date. Um, it's also a great resource to share with your family members if they're concerned about you traveling to the US. Um, the dashboard shows data um, of UC San Diego students and employees who have tested positive for COVID, um, how many positive cases there are that particular day. Um, so as of yesterday's data, for example, there have been five students residing on campus who tested positive, two students residing off campus who have tested positive, and one campus employee who tested positive. This is out of nearly 270,000 tests. So as you can see, there's a very low percentage of positive cases among our, our campus population. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at this site. Again, use it as a resource and stay updated on current numbers. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it to my colleague, Mary. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, so um, just to talk a bit more about the um, COVID vaccine compliance and return to learn um, steps that are important for students to be aware of. So they're in anticipation of your matriculation at UC San Diego. Um, we do want to emphasize that there is a COVID-19 vaccination mandate in place for students, faculty, and staff. So this is for the safety and well-being of the entire university community. As Gabby said, you know, the, the numbers on our campus currently of positive uh, cases is extremely low. Um, and much of this is due to, you know, all of the safety protocols that UC San Diego has taken um, and that the community members have taken as well. So the policy that is currently in place does require with few exceptions that all students, faculty and staff be fully vaccinated against the COVID-19 virus. So we bring this up um, because as a student um, who may matriculate to UC San Diego, um, it's important to be aware of this mandate to be sure that you can begin taking steps to become compliant. And so on the websites that have been shared in this presentation, you'll find more details around ways to become compliant. Um, you know, of course, 
coming from different countries, there may be different opportunities to become vaccinated. Um, you know, it can take some time if you are not already fully vaccinated. So we want to share this information now um, so that you can begin thinking about and begin taking steps to be sure um, that you can become compliant or go through any processes, either being fully vaccinated or having a um, uh, essentially um, some sort of documentation on your account stating that you have an exemption um, in order to be able to be on campus safely and to prevent any administrative holds that may be placed on one's record if they are not compliant um, in fall 2022 with the vaccine um, compliant or vaccine mandate, excuse me. So um, you will be receiving more information on the COVID-19 compliance steps and the Return to Learn website um, with concrete steps for you to take to become compliant. But we do just want to emphasize that this is something that is in place um, for our campus community. And it's important to begin taking steps toward compliance to avoid any administrative holds that may be placed on your account down the line. All right, um, so that concludes the majority of our webinar for this morning or this afternoon, this evening, wherever you may be. Um, but I just have a few important deadlines and reminders before we get to our open question and answer segment of today's webinar. So um, there are two things that you can do right now. Um, so one is begin requesting your visa documents via the iPortal. Um, and to do that, just go to iPortal.ucsd.edu, like we talked about today's webinar. The other thing you can do is actually start applying for on-campus housing. Um, so I'll go ahead and pop that link into the chat. Um, but if you are interested in living in our campus operative housing, um, definitely consider applying early as that will um, really help the process. If you have questions about the COVID-19 vaccine, as well as maybe some other required immunization require, uh, immunizations and insurance, um, we will have our colleagues from Student Health join us next week, actually. So on March 21st, we have our pre-arrival webinar with Student Health um, going over insurance and immunization requirements, and you can register at iwebinars.ucsd.edu. And again, click on webinars for newly admitted students. Um, uh, a friendly reminder, in summer, uh, most likely July, is when you will need to meet those requirements. Um, and then in September is when we will welcome you with our live new international student orientation. Um, if you're curious about what that might look like, um, feel free to head to iorientation.ucsd.edu. So in addition to our student health webinar coming up on March 21st, we also have um, these webinars. As you can see, they cover just a, a wide variety of topics, but topics that are often really relevant to your experience as an international graduate student at UC San Diego. So on March 29th, we'll have graduate student housing. So focusing not only on on-campus, but as well as off-campus housing options. On April 5th, we'll talk a little bit about teaching assistantships as well as English requirements. On May 3rd, we'll talk about graduate student funding. On May 10th, CBIS transfers. So if you're transferring your CBIS record from one US institution to another, um, to our institution. May 12th, um, we'll talk a little bit about student life and getting involved on campus as an international graduate student. And May 17th, we'll talk about campus safety. All webinars are recorded and posted at iWebinars. And we do typically ask for 10 to 15 business days um, to wait for those webinars to be posted. And that allows our our marketing and communication team enough time to edit the webinar, to upload it to our website um, and all that good stuff. Okay, so with that, we are now headed in to our um, question and answer section at the end of the webinar. And I can see that we already have lots of really good questions. Um, so we're excited to jump in. And one question that we have um, is, for Gabi. So the question reads, I'm already studying in the United States, and I would like to know when I should send my I-20 copy, since my program starts in summer, the end of June, and the best steps on how to proceed. 
Yes. So if I understand correctly, um, you are uh, going to be doing a what is called a CVIS transfer. So like you said, you're already in the U.S. Um, you it sounds like you are already in F1 status at another school and you want to transfer that F1 status over to UC San Diego. Uh, we have a lot of graduate students in the same situation, so this is a great question, um, and I'm glad you asked it because um, it applies to a lot of students. Yes, if, if that is the case, um, you can um, apply through the iPortal. In fact, all of our students, even if you are transferring like yourself, you still need to submit an iPortal request to request your UC San Diego I-20. Um, what that particular request will do is it will prompt you to upload a copy of your current I-20 from your, your previous school or your, your current school. And it will ask you a series of questions like the date that you plan to transfer your record over to us, when your school will release it to us and so forth so that we know exactly how to act on the record. So um, you, we encourage you to do that now if you can, especially if your program is starting in June um, and work with your international student advisor at your current school to arrange your CVIS re record release date so we can issue your uh, UCSD I-20 in time for you to start your program in June. Great. All right, this next question is probably for Mary. Um, so the question reads, can we ask our undergraduate school to email scanned copies of our transcripts to UC San Diego, or do they need to be physically mailed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the answer is yes. Um, however, if they're coming from the institution, you have to make sure that they're coming from an official email address. So an individual who works at the institution um, where we can essentially verify um, that these are official um, and that they are, um, you know, real. Um, so of course we always want to think and assume um, that everything coming to us is, um, you know, a true copy or official. Um, but so it can't just come from another individual with a name that isn't yours. So it needs to be someone like with a email address from that institution with an official signature. Ideally, if it's coming from an individual at the school itself, it's a official document that the school was able to produce and not necessarily a scanned document. Um, so typically schools are able to generate electronic transcripts. Um, and either send them through a secure third party sender or through um, an official, you know, registrar address from the school's institution or from the institution. So it just has, to, we have to be able to verify that it's official. So in order to avoid any administrative processing delays, um, you know, it's best just to make sure you're connecting with your school to verify how it's being sent. All right, so I believe this next question might be for Shauna. Um, so this, the question reads, I've been offered an admission by the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, but I'm yet to receive the official offer of admission from UC San Diego. What should I do? Sorry, I actually am going to have to defer to Mary on this one. Um, I feel like this is a situation that probably a lot of students um, experience. So I was kind of hoping that she'd be able to talk about it. Yeah. So actually, this is not a very common um, occurrence. Um, so if you have not yet received an official admission from UC San Diego, then, you know, your, your status as an admitted student is not official at this time. So it may be that you've connected you know, with a department and that they've shared, you know, that you're a top candidate or something like that. Um, but until the department communicates with UC San Diego's graduate division admissions team um, and everything is verified and you're provisionally admitted, um, and then you are not technically admitted to UC San Diego. Um, so, I would definitely recommend following up with the department if there's any confusion around your status at this time. Um, and because you you should, if, if you are considered an admitted student, you would have received that admission letter um, from UC San Diego. Mary, can you maybe just speak to, once the department notifies 
um, our office, your, your staff that mm-hmm. they, or the department or program that they want to admit someone, like approximately how long does, will it be before they get <clears throat> an official offer of admission from us? Yeah, so it can take up to two weeks um, during peak admissions times. So, um, you know, there's hundreds of students that are being nominated by departments. Um, so it can take up to two weeks. Um, our team does their absolute best um, to process, you know, in the nominations. But um, the reason there is this process is there are times where, um, you know, a department may wish to admit a student and they may be missing a document that's required by UC San Diego um, for graduate admission. So um, again, I would connect with your um, program just to make sure you're clear on the language that was shared with you um, and that you're also clear on um, you know, any next steps that they may have shared um, with you as well. Our next question is for Gabi. Um, and the question reads, is it possible to obtain a support letter from UC San Diego to help in the visa process? Yes, um, it is. Um, I do want to uh, make a, a, a distinction. So um, due to the volume of requests that we receive in general for I-20 issuance, DS-2019 issuance, um, we can't provide a support letter for every student just for their initial visa appointment. However, um, if your, your visa is put through administrative processing, there are delays, or if there's a denial, um, yes, you can rep- um, apply for a support letter via the iPortal. Um, you'll see that request type in the iPortal when you log in, um, and we can provide that to you. Uh, but as a standard piece of documentation, we don't, we don't include that, only if you are experiencing issues. All right, these next few um, are probably for Gabi as well. Um, So this next question reads, um, in case I need an earlier start date, what are my actions um, or the steps I should take? So I have requested my department and I'm waiting for the reply. Should I wait for the reply or can I proceed with my iPortal application? Yes, great question. So we we do have a number of students who participate in early start programs. They might be um, prep programs, boot camps, that sort of thing of different nature um, to help prepare students before they start their main main program. Um, If you are part of an early start program, we do need some kind of evidence that you are accepted into that early start program. So um, we would need documentation from your department uh, confirming that you are part of it so that you can upload that to your iPortal application and we can then in turn uh, issue you with the correct um, visa paperwork. Um, without that, we would you would just get a standard um, September start date. So make sure you have that in place first before you begin your application. All right, this next question is, how can we verify that all of our financial documents are valid and acceptable? Are there any documents that are not accepted and which the I-20 request would be denied? Uh, Yes, so we actually have a helpful chart on that's listed on our website and it's linked in the iPortal application when you begin your application. So hopefully you can have that up and you can take a look. Um, It actually outlines what we do accept and Grace is helpful, we put that in the chat as well. Um, In general, what documents we accept and what we do not accept. Uh, For example, we accept loans, that is totally, totally fine, but it has to be like a letter confirming that you've received an approval for a loan. It cannot be just a letter that you are applying for a loan, for example. Um, We don't accept uh, anything basically other than um, evidence of liquid uh, accessible uh, uh, money, basically, because this is what the embassy will expect. If there's anything um, in investments or anything stocks, bonds related, or in property, things that are not, you know, accessible cash, so to speak, um, those are not accepted. Um, but if it's if it's liquid funds, uh, we accept bank statements from you yourself or family members. They can be, be online e-bank statements. That is totally fine. Um, They can be letters uh, confirming their support as well, letters from your department, um, but they have to be valid from within the last six months from the day that you um, submit your iPortal application. 
All right. Um, our next question reads, I want to apply for an F2 visa for my spouse. Should I wait for my F1 approval or can I apply right away? Um, if you're ready and you have all your documentation, we highly encourage you to apply right away, actually, as part of your F1 application, because then we can do both at, at the same time. Um, if you're unsure, sometimes students are not sure if their, you know, their spouse or their children are going to join them and they apply at a later time, that's, that's completely acceptable as well. But if you know right now, we encourage you to apply together. All right, this next question is, I'm looking to join the Ready School of Management for fall 2022 and I have a question. If I get more fellowship from the department um, after I submit my request for the I-20, can I update the request with the revised fellowship documentation before the I-20 is uploaded in my iPortal? Ooh, it's a good one. Uh, it depends on timing, right? So if, if an advisor receives your request and process it, processes it before you're able to get that uh, additional documentation, it will be processed, it will be uploaded, but you can always submit an amendment request after the fact. We can always add that and then uh, process another one for you, no problem. Um, but if you want to make changes to your iPortal application um, and it has not been processed yet by an advisor, uh, just send us a quick email at iustudent at ucsd.edu. Um, we can open up your application to allow you to upload additional documentation so that everything is, is accurate on your I-20. All right, our next question is, if I hold a B2 visa, a visitor visa currently, am I eligible for a visa interview waiver for the F1? So that you will need to check with your local com uh, consulate or embassy. We cannot unfortunately comment on visa waiver eligibility at this level. Um, so we encourage you to check with your local embassy and they can confirm for you. All right, and our next question is, what about passport um, dates? So the validity, for example, um, is February 22nd to 2023 okay? Um, entering on August 27th of 2023. So can you speak a little bit more to acceptable passport dates? Yeah, so the, the general rule of thumb <clears throat> uh, is that it must be valid six months into the future after your intended date of entry. So just looking at your dates here, if you were coming in um, the end of August, your passport expires more or less the end of February, you're probably fine. You're within that kind of more or less that six month window. Um, but if it's anything closer than that, we would encourage you to renew it. Um, if you are able to now when you're in your home country it's faster to sometimes it is faster to renew your your passport there than while you're when you're in the u.s through through your embassy or consulate in the u.s um so try to do it if you can but if not that that does seem like a valid um time period all right um this next question is can we show change of address proof um I read this a little differently. Maybe you can clarify the student. So chain, um, chain of address, or is it care of? I'm not entirely sure. Oh, maybe it's that, Gabby. Yeah, no. I, yeah. <laughs> it's a, um, but maybe maybe the student can clarify. It's, it's um, care of. It, I'm assuming. Um, I'm yes, assuming. They, they clarified care of. Sorry. Okay. You were correct. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm assuming this is for financial documentation or where the document is going. I, I'm, I'm not quite clear, but I can address either. Um, if it's care of for, for financial documentation, um, we don't necessarily need proof. Uh, a document um, accompanying, if it's a financial document that has a different address or a different name on it, is fine, just explaining a relationship. Um, if it's an address, a care of, where your document is going to be mailed, um, you, additionally, you don't need to show any kind of proof. We will just mail it to the address that you indicate in your iPortal application. So hopefully that helps. All right, our next question is, um, can the financial statement show to UCSD for the I-20 application be the same for the U.S. Embassy? Um, so can I show that exact statement to the U.S. Embassy? Yes, in, in fact, we would encourage that um, if possible. Um, if whatever documentation you use to obtain your visa documents from us, um, we encourage you to use those for your visa appointment as well. Um, that's, that's probably the easiest and that's totally fine to use for, for the Embassy. 
All right, I do see um, a few questions about webinar recording. So um, friendly reminder, we typically ask for 10 to 15 business days um, for the webinar rec recording to be posted to our website. Um, that just allows our marketing and communication team time to edit um, and upload the video. Um, but it will be posted to that same place where you are trying to, um, where you register for those webinars. So iwebinars.ucsd.edu um, and clicking on webinars for newly admitted students. And once we post webinar recordings, you'll see two sections of the website. So one section will be um, previous webinars, access the recording and it'll list them. And then it'll be upcoming web webinars register below and then you'll register. So it'll be broken up into two different sections once we start posting those webinar recordings. All right. Um, our next question is, are we supposed to show the same source of funding while applying for both the I-20 and the visa? Um, can I show my parents as sponsors for the I-20 and then show my personal funds while applying for the visa? Yes, this is fine. Um, in general, we sort of, um, the I-20 lumps together personal funds. It's usually lumped together as um, personal slash family funds. Um, so as long as it's within that same kind of category, that's completely fine. It's, it's personal family funds. Um, you can you can do that. If it were something like suddenly you received sponsorship, let's say from uh, a private organization or a home government um, that was totally different, then we would we would encourage you to update this on your I twenty um, before you go for your interview. But this is totally fine within the same family of, of funding. All right. Um, so this student has submitted their I-20 application on March 3rd, um, but up until now, the status of the application has not changed. Um, it still shows submitted to International Student Advisor. Is this normal or expected? Yes, this is totally normal. So um, what we encourage students to do is to check the due date that's listed in their iPortal application. It should for this um, March 3rd date should show the 18th, which is this Friday. Um, so that's okay that it hasn't moved to submit it from submitted yet. It does mean still that an advisor is reviewing it. Totally expected, totally normal. Um, if we have questions, we will let you know. We'll reach out um, via your iPortal application if we need anything additional, but it should be ready by this eight, by the 18th for you to download um, your I-20. All right, our next question is, while well, filling in the, or filing the DS-160 um, form, what should I fill in as the intended date of arrival? Um, I know that my program starts on August 1st, but the orientation date is still not finalized, finalized. So I'd like to know what the safe answer for this question is. Yeah, I would say go with the August 1st, because that's the official program start date. Um, one thing I meant to mention in the webinar is that, um, for every student, whether you have an I-20 or a DS 2019, you are allowed to enter the US up to 30 days before the start date that is listed there. So you have some wiggle room, you have some flexibility. Um, let's say orientation started, I don't know, maybe a week you know, before August 1st, um, you would still be able to enter by that date, um, even if it's not officially listed on your documents. So I would go with the official program start um, as the, the quote unquote safe answer for this application. Right. Our next question is, um, if I want to live with my wife and my daughter while in the U.S. Um, while I'm at my graduate program, do they need a J-1 visa or is it another type of visa? Yeah, great question. Um, this is really personal preference, I would say, and, and situational. So um, graduate students, um, if they are receiving 50% or more funding for their program, either from their department um, or um, a, a different source like a home government or, or international organization, they have the choice between the F1 or the J1. And then their um, dependents, their spouse or children, will get the either F2 or J2. Um, each benefit, uh, each visa type has its benefits and drawbacks. Uh, just very briefly, in general, the J-1 allows the J-2 spouse uh, to be employed in the United States while they are here. Um, the F-2, so the, the dependent visa for the F-1 type, does not allow employment. Um, so that's just one you know, piece of, of the difference um, and, and tends to be 
um, pivotal in for our students making that decision and if they would like their spouse to be able to work, for example, but we encourage you to take a look at the chart that's listed that Grace uh, linked to earlier, um, or you can just search F1 versus J1 on our, our website. Um, and that will bring you to the differences and you can kind of weigh the benefits or disadvantages. Um, and you're welcome to contact us as well if you want to talk through it. Um, but again, if they have that type, you have that type of funding for your program, you're eligible to choose either. All right, so this next question might be for our um, graduate admissions and division folks. Um, so the question reads, my official degree certificate is still under process and the deadline for my acceptance is March 16th. Um, I've seen that there is a long wait time for accommodation and I'm still looking for on campus. Um, is there anything that can be done? So I am a little confused about this March 16th deadline. Um, Mary, I don't know if you can speak to that, but the graduate division wouldn't require your degree certificate by March 16th. So I don't know if that's something within your program. Um, the other thing, and sorry, Mary, I'm going to address the accommodation part and then I'll hand it no, off back to you. That part oh. right. So that's all I have to say is that that's the deadline that we have. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. Your portal and make sure that you have plenty of time to submit a degree certificate. That's something that students who matriculate in the fall can submit like through fall quarter. Yeah, so wherever you found that deadline, I would say address that directly with whatever office or entity um, indicated that that would be the, the timeline. The other thing I wanted to address within this question is about on-campus um, accommodations, on-campus housing. You can actually apply for on-campus housing before you've accepted your admission. So if you've, if you've been accepted, officially accepted to UC San Diego, that is enough to begin the process of applying for housing. That's my understanding. Um, we do have our housing webinar coming up in two weeks. So there is that. And um, last year's webinar is also, I believe, available if you also wanted to, uh, if you couldn't wait two weeks and you wanted to see what we talked about last year, it would be a little bit different, but this process should still be the, the policy. Um, you can also contact housing directly. Um, but if you, I guess what I just wanna stress is if you have your official offer of admission, that's all you need for housing and you don't have to wait to apply. All right, um, so we are a bit over on our time today. Um, so again, if for some reason we did not get the chance to answer your question, please know that you can always um, email the iNewStudent at, UCS, at ucsd.edu, or you can fill out our contact um, form at icontact.ucsd.edu. Those are two great ways to get in contact with our office, and we'll be sure to answer those questions. Um, and then Shauna also referenced, so that's a great point. Um, we will be posting all of this year's webinar recordings on our website, but you can also access our ISPO YouTube channel and that has um, all previous webinar recordings. And so if you are anxious to get some of that information, please know that some of that information might have changed on a year to year basis, right? Um, so this webinar, this year's webinar will be the most up to date. Um, but if you wanna familiarize yourself um, and maybe get a sneak peek that would be a great way to do so. So you'll see that we have some webinar recordings from um, previous pre-arrival seasons. We also have some orientation um, webinar recordings and just a variety of different videos. So if you are curious, that is reference, um, but please do know that some of that information might be year specific. Um, so with that, we hope that you have a great rest of your day, whether it be morning or afternoon or evening. Um, we hope that we'll see you again for another upcoming pre-arrival webinar. And yes, um, welcome and congratulations again on your admittance to UC San Diego. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.